Hello and welcome to a quick video on Chapter 1 of Enterprise Networking, Security and Automation. My name is Kelly Caldwell. I work at Stanley Community College's Instructor Training Center. And I will be giving you a uh, quick overview of Chapter 1. And we're going to take a look at single area OSPF concepts. To begin with, however, I want to back up just a little bit and go over a couple concepts that are not really covered in the chapter uh, that are necessary to, for this discussion of a dynamic routing protocol especially one like OSPF. To begin with, I want to discuss with you the concept of what is called an autonomous system. Now, an autonomous system is a group of routers under the control of a single administration running the same interior gateway protocol. Interior gateway protocols are those dynamic routing protocols designed to run within autonomous systems. So for instance, let's imagine you run a company and your company has 200, 300 routers spread over multiple different sites. You can have a single autonomous system that runs OSPF within that autonomous system. Now you'd be running multi OSPF, but that autonomous system is under the control of that one company and it runs one interior gateway protocol. If, however, you were a very large organization like a government, you may have different autonomous systems. So you may have an autonomous system for your health and human services, and an autonomous system for your military, an autonomous system for another branch of your government. If you're gonna route between autonomous systems, we use what are called exterior gateway protocols. Those are dynamic routing, pro routing protocols between autonomous systems. Now an autonomous system is, it, it can be actually defined by a number given out by an RFC. And it's also when we think about routing between autonomous systems, with exterior gateway protocols, we think mainly about ISPs who are routing between different supported customers' autonomous systems. So in, in many cases, even though BGP has become much more important even in uh, smaller networks these days, BGP or the border gateway protocol is the exterior gateway protocol that we discuss. Uh, it's really the only one in use now uh, between autonomous systems. And we used to have another protocol actually called EGP, but it was replaced by border gateway protocol. This particular class, entire, actually the entire CCNA, no longer has a great deal of information about BGP. If you're interested, I put a website here, learn.nsrc.org, which has a series of a, over 100 videos discussing BGP so you can learn more about BGP. Right now, it's important for you just to know that for EGPs or exterior gateway protocols, those are the protocols used to route between autonomous systems. Most of the protocols that we deal with on a daily basis are interior gateway protocols. These are protocols designed to run within the autonomous system. Underneath IGPs, there's two subtypes. There's what we call distance vector routing protocols. Now these protocols have typically been simpler. Uh, they use easier to configure methods. They are um, in many ways, sometimes, especially RIP V1 and V2, they are sometimes called routing by rumor because in some of the traditional distance vector routing protocols, the routers did not talk directly to all other routers in an internetwork. They would talk just to the directly connected neighbors. So you get a situation where when you had like a classroom example of whispering something in someone's ear and have them whisper that to their neighbor and then 30 people later, the original message that you gave was completely different. Um, so sometimes you call distance vector routing protocols routing by rumor. They do typically traditionally use what are called periodic updates. So for instance, RIP version one and version two will send the entire routing table out every 30 seconds, regardless of whether or not there's been a change. There's been a bunch of different things done to distance vector routing protocols to make them a little better. For instance, EIGRP used to be called a hybrid protocol because it actually uses triggered updates. It has a much better understanding of the entire topology of the network, it has an adjacency table, has a topology table, but it is still a distance vector routing protocol. And so for that reason, uh, it is firmly in the distance vector category. IGRP or interior gateway routing protocol is an older version of the enhanced interior gateway routing protocol. So it's just put here for historical context. Link state, which is what OSPF is, these routing protocols have a full understanding of the network. So they understand all the link states. They understand their directly connected neighbors. They understand the topology table. And they use that topology table to build the best paths through a network. They use a complex metric. Uh, for instance, 
In OSPF, it uses what is known as cost, and that cost is uh, based upon the speed of the link between different OSPF neighbors, or actually the link on an OSPF network. They are typically a little harder to configure, although OSPF, especially in the way it's we're using it in CCNA, in our case, we're using it for single area OSPF only, is really not that hard to configure. Uh, but OSPF does have the ability to do multi-area. And when you get into multi-area OSPF, when you get into, uh, if you move into CCMP study with CCMP Enterprise Core, you'll learn about stubby areas, not so stubby areas, totally stubby areas. Uh, you can see that OSPF can very quickly become uh, difficult to configure. Link state router, uh, routing protocols, and I put routers here, but it should be routing protocols. That's my mistake. Link state routing protocols are um, typically use triggered updates. In other words, when a change occurs in a link state that is sent out to the link state uh, in a link state update to different uh, members of that particular network. And one thing I'm gonna tell you folks, you'll notice just like there, I had a typo. I go with what I call a good enough um, video philosophy. Uh, if you sit in the classroom with me and I'm lecturing you in the classroom, I am not going to be absolutely perfect. No one is. So I'm not going to try to be absolutely perfect in these videos. You're getting what you would get from me if you were sitting in the classroom and getting the lecture. So I'll misspeak, I'll do ums, I'll do ahs, but we will get through this together and it will be, I hope, useful for you in some way. So as we go into our discussion of OSPF, it's important to remember that OSPF is an interior gateway protocol, so it's used within an autonomous system. It is a link state routing protocol. So it is a product protocol that has a full understanding of the network, more complex metric, although the cost really isn't that complex. Um, it does, mostly, most of the time when we think about link state routing protocols, they do consume more memory and um, on a router because you have to hold multiple tables, especially when you compare something like OSPF to RIP. RIP has one table, the routing table, that's it, for the information base for, for RIP v1, v2, or just the routing table. OSPF has three different tables in it, so it takes more memory to hold those. So with that, we're gonna jump over to the Cisco curriculum, and we're gonna look at, uh, we're gonna look at some basic features of OSPF, we're gonna look at some of the packet types, and I will say this chapter goes into pretty in-depth look at the packet types, not so sure that you need some of this um, for a, a basic understanding of OSPF, but we'll, we'll go over it. And then we'll look at how sing, single OSPF, uh, single area OSPF works, both in, both in a um, non-broadcast multi-access or we're having, or not really non-broadcast multi-access. We're gonna look at multi-access like ethernet and then in point-to-point -point links where there's a difference. So as we look at OSPF, there are a couple different things that we have here. One is our routing protocol messages, and we're gonna look at all the different types of them. So as we move down here, I'll get into the actual packet types. Um, but we have hello packets, DDBs, or database description packets, link state packets, uh, requests, LSRs, LSURs, or link state requests, link state updates, and link state acknowledgements. Here is where OSPF starts to consume more memory versus a um, distance vector routing protocol. All OSPF routers must maintain what is known as an adjacency database or a neighbor table. So the adjacency database, which is formed, tells the router to keep up with all of its directly connected neighbors. We'll talk about how that process occurs shortly. It will then have to create a link state database, which is a topology database of all the links that it has built looking at the link state updates it has received and the database packets it received. And then using the Dijkstra algorithm or the shortest path first algorithm, the OSPF then builds its forwarding database, which is the routing table. So instead of RIP, which has just the routing table based upon the number of hops, that's the metric for RIP. Uh, for the, the best path is the one with the shortest number of hops. OSPF has to build all of these different tables in order to be able to function correctly. And then we have the Dijkstra algorithm, which is the shortest path first. And so it's gonna look at all the different paths to a particular network, find the one with the least cost. And by the way, the higher speed a link is, the lower cost it has. Um, so that's how it figures out the best way to get there. The shortest path is the least cost path. Now, when we go into OSPF, and OSPF 
you, you start up OSPF on a router. One of the first things I want to talk a little bit about is what is called the router ID. I have actually created a um, NetLab preservation. And in this, I've got a couple of routers. I've got router one, router two, and by the way, this is the topology, R1, R2, and we've got gig 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 001. These are 40, I believe it's 4,300 series routers. Let's go in here and take a quick peek, show ver. Uh, yep, there are, these are 4,300s. One of my 4,300s here. So um, what we're gonna do, actually I just show platform to be show platform but it's a 4321 and show platform shows me my, the fact this is a chassis type 4321 with a K9 image. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna first off do a show IP and brief. And you'll notice that all interfaces, even though the 000 is up and 001 is up, um, there's no IP address on it. So I'm going to global config and I'm gonna to try to do router OSPF. And this is a command by the way to turn on OSPF, router OSPF one. And one is just a process ID. It could be any number. It does not have to match between uh, routers in the same area. Now, it did, you'll notice, you get a message that says, OSPF process one failed to allocate unique, unique router ID and cannot start. That is because each router gives itself a router ID in OSPF. By default, it is the highest IP address on any loopback. You'll notice when it is show IP, show IP at brief, there is no loopback address configured. So the router cannot give itself a router ID using the highest loopback address. It then goes and tries to use the highest physical address on a, an interface. You'll notice now that with gigabit ethernet 000 and 001, there are no IP addresses there. So there's no IP address on a physical interface. As a result, even though I'm trying to enable router OSPF and I'm in config router, the process failed to start. So at this point, I'm really not running OSPF. So the thing you would need to do is either set using the router ID command and whatever you want it to be, I'm gonna make this one just for, for now, 1111, okay? And router ID is a 32-bit uh, ID. Even on routers running IPv6, OSPF version three, and IPv6, the router ID is a 32-bit uh, entity or number. Now, if I do this, at this point, OSPF should be able to start, the process should, should actually start. So I'll do show uh, IP OSPF. And you'll see that it is now started. The process has started with the ID 1111. See my start time, and you see that it's now running. But if I don't have a physical address or I don't have an IP address on a loopback, I don't have an IP address on a, an interface, a physical interface, and I don't have the router ID set, OSPF cannot actually start, it cannot allocate. So router IDs are very important uh, to have set up. And that's why you typically configure your IP addresses on your router first, get all your interfaces up, and then you configure your routing protocol. So just a little quick aside there showing you router ID and the fact that router ID can be set in those different ways and how they can be allocated. Router ID becomes important uh, down the road when we start looking at uh, establishing who will be the DR designated router or the backup designated router on multi-access networks. So the first thing we wanna do is we establish neighbor adjacency. So each router has to send out hello packets and determine its neighbors. We'll go through this process in more detail later also, but that's the first thing that happens. Hello packets go out. And by the way, there is a hello interval, which by default is 10 seconds. If routers in the same OSPF area do not share the same hello interval timer, hello dead, hello wait and dead time timers, they will not form an adjacency. This is different than EIGRP. Now, I know we don't really talk about EIGRP and CCNA anymore, but in EIGRP, uh, the routers can have a different hello wait and dead timer and they will negotiate together to figure out what hello wait and dead timer to use. In OSPF, they must match. If not, you will not form an, a neighbor adjacency. So the first thing we're gonna do is form a neighbor adjacency with our hello packets. Then we're gonna stand, send link state advertisements to tell everyone about our link state. So we're gonna say, I'm connected to the 10100 slash 16 network 
10, 2, 10, 2, 0, 0, 10, 3, and so on and so forth, and flood that out to everyone. That is being flooded, so it's being multicast or flooded out, so that all other routers get this. So it's not routing by rumor. We're not just sending it to R2, we're not just sending it to R3, and then letting them send it over to R5. R1 would actually flood its LSAs through the entire network. All the routers will then build the link state database. So they'll figure out all the different link states they've, they've found out during the flooding. They'll use the Dijkstra or shortest path first algorithm to find the shortest path. And then that best path will be placed into the routing table based upon cost. And that's what these particular images show you. Now, in OSPF, there are different ways to look at single area and multi area OSPF. Uh, first off, all OSPF networks must have an area zero. That is called the backbone. We are going to focus on in this class just single area OSPF. So, in single area OSPF, uh, in your, uh, golly, single area OSPF, you will be using area zero as your entity at the end of each of your network statements. With multi-area OSPF, what you can do is you can, let's say you had Area 51 in New Mexico, Area 1 in Chicago, Area 0 in New York. You can actually make these different areas and then that is a bounded area within which updates will stay and also uh, within where certain types of updates are contained. If you move into looking at CCMP Enterprise Core, you will actually look at what types of summary advertisements are sent between areas. You'll see um, how you can actually make an area what's called a stubby area. So if area 51 had no other way out than R2, you can actually turn it into a stubby area. So it's only advertising one route out or a, only having a single route advertised in instead of having multiple routes being shared in and out. Um, but all that is beyond the scope of the CCNA. The big thing about multi-area OSPF is that it does allow the routers inside of those areas to have smaller routing tables. There's reduced link state overhead. So if a link goes down, if you make multiple areas and a link goes down in area 51, that single link information is not sent all the way through area zero and area one. It stays bounded within area 51, which reduces your frequency of SPF calculation. So you got a bouncing link in area 51, it's going to have zero impact on area zero and area one if you configure multi-area correctly. The big thing about it, it makes OSPF scalable. So you can go from a network that has hundreds and hundreds of routers, break them into different areas, and make sure that inside of those areas are the only places that certain items or certain failures cause updates and uh, SPF calculations. Again, beyond the scope of this class, but uh, if you go into CCMP Enterprise Core, there's an entire section on OSPF multi-area. We also have two different types of OSPF. We had OSPF version two, which is for IPv4, and OSPF version three, which is for IPv6. It is possible to run them concurrently. So you can have OSPF uh, three, version two and three running at the same time. It does have a separate process, which means that if you're running them both, you have two neighbor tables, one for each protocol, P4, V6, two topology tables, and two routing tables. So be aware, when you turn these on, it does cause you to have multiple different uh, tables, which can consume more memory. And so that's our basic introduction. So let's talk now about OSPF packets. There's a video here you can watch. I'm not going to go over that at this moment. We're going to look at some different types of packets. OSPF has what is called a type 1 packet, which is your hello packet. That is the packet used to discover your neighbors and build your neighbor adjacency table. Type two or the database description packet is the abbreviated list of the link state, data, link state database. All right. And in that database description packet, the link state database, all routers in an area must construct, have, must have the same link state database. And they must all use that to construct a shadow, uh, source path three. Source path first tree, okay? So the, the big thing there is it's used to make sure everyone has a full understanding of all of the links in a network. You then have link state requests. So if a router needs more information about an entry in the database description packets, 
it'll send a link state request. That's type three. Type four link state updates. Uh, it's where you use an LSR. Uh, link state request goes out and then the router that has information will send out a link state uh, update. And then we have link state acknowledgements. Now be aware that we, it is, OSPF is an acknowledgement based protocol. So we acknowledge near, basically everything except for hello packets and link state acknowledgement. So we were not gonna uh, LSA ACK or LS ACK a, a hello or another ACK. So that would be crazy. So link state routing type three is used to request more information from the database, link state database. And then type four is used to send an update. Now inside of type fours, there are other link state advertisement types or different types of advertisements inside of here. They're up to 11 actually. And we look at a router LSA, okay, which is a link on a router, type two synchronization between routers, summary LSAs, which can be a summary between um, different autonomous systems, excuse me, not autonomous systems, different areas, Autonomous system exterior LSA, which would be a route that could be injected into a, an OSPF and on so on and so forth. We're not gonna go into great detail on these simply because uh, they're not really needed for uh, the same simple configuration of OSPF we use for, for CCNA. Here's a hello packet. You will notice that one of the primary things in here is the router ID and the area ID because routers will only listen hello packets from their area, and they're looking for a router ID, and we'll talk about why that's used. And I showed you earlier how you get your router ID. Remember, it's either the highest IP address on any loopback, or the highest IP address on any physical interface, or actually set using the router ID command inside of OSPF. There'll also be down here, see there's a dead interval, hello interval. These have to match. If these don't, then there's going to be a problem because you will not form an adjacency. The router priority is also a, an item that's used, which is what's called DRBDR election. We'll talk about here in a few minutes. But uh, basically the default priority is one, and then DRBDR is based upon who has the highest ID. But we're gonna change this to make sure we're controlling who becomes the DR and the BDR. All right, so there's our packet types. Now let's look at operation. When OSPF comes up, one of the first things it's gonna do is all routers are in the down state. Okay. So no hello packets have been received. The router sends out its hello packets and transitions to init, init. In the init state, hello packets have been received from the neighbor router and they contain the router ID of the sending router. Now, one of the things you sometimes get is a concept of what is called stuck in init. And what happens, this typically happens when you've got um, unidirectional communication on a link. In other words, the routers are able to see one another's hello packets, or at least one router can see a hello packet, but it's getting hello packets and its opposite neighbor can't see the hello packet from it, which means, if you look in the video, it actually goes through this pretty, pretty clearly. When the neighbor relationship right here, we're in down, we go to knit. I send my hello across, or I try to send it. And let's say that I send it here, but R2 doesn't get it. And R2 sends back a hello. Well, typically what happens in the init state is that I receive back when I send my hello packet. I get back a hello packet, unicast back to me with my actual router ID. In this case, this is the router ID of 172.16.5.1, which is R1. That router ID is in the hello packet that comes back from R2. That tells me when I send my hello over and say, this is me, I'm 5.1, I get one back that says, oh, hey, I'm R2, and I just heard from 5.1, that must be you. This lets the two routers know they got bi-directional or two-way communication. Where you get a stuck in a knit is when you're sending over hello packets and they're not getting there. So in other words, this router's in and down, it goes into a knit because it's sending out, trying to send out this hello. It's not getting to R2, but R2 is sending hellos over. And because it hasn't seen this original hello from R1, 
it's sending it without R1's IP address in that hello. And so R1 stays in the init stage, cannot transition two-way, because R1 can only transition to two-way by seeing a hello packet from R2 that has its IP address in it. And that's what's called stuck in init. And you'll see that sometimes when you've only got unidirectional communication on a link. If things are working correctly, the two routers will actually see their uh, neighbor, their own IP address in their neighbor's hello, and that will transition to the two-way state. If then you have a multi-access network, in other words, you have a, an ethernet network for the most part, you're gonna have an, a DR and BDR election, we'll, and we'll explain why in, in just a few minutes. But the basic reason is because every router has to form an adjacency with every other router. And in a multi-access network, if there are many routers in a network, you have to form an enormous number of adjacencies. So we, we basically find, create a central point to where uh, link state advertisements can go and then be sent back out by a designated router. And then there's a BDR to take over in case the DR goes out. All right. Now look here. In this case, both of the routers had the default priority of one. Neither one of these had been configured as having a router ID. So the router IDs were actually the IP addresses on their gigabit interfaces. And so R2 had the higher router ID and it would become the DR. Now this would be true even if R1 was your Cisco router sitting in your core that had all the memory and all the speed and capacity. And R2 was a little 1900 series, you know, Soho router sitting out that a small office. This would be the DR because you did not change the default behavior on DR and BDR election. We'll talk about how you can do that later. Now, once we do that, next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna decide the first router. That's also based upon the router ID. So R2 has got the router, highest router ID, so it's gonna send its uh, database description packets before R1. Then we'll send it. R2 will send over its uh, summary of its link state database packets. It'll be act. Remember, we act everything except for hellos and other acts. Here's another summary. Thanks for the information. So basically, each one of these will exchange their link state database and act it. Once that's done, we can ask for additional information. So let's say that for whatever reason, what's getting that database description from R2, R1 needed more information on the 16.0 network. It can send a link state request a type three, I need more information on 16.6.0, and then a, uh, this is probably a type one, it's actually a type four reply database description packet, but is then a type one underneath that database description packet. To say, here's the information I have on this, and then we act that information. So you can see there's a lot going on in here uh, in order for them to get all of this information. Now what will eventually happen, as we will see, is once they exchange the link state database information and they all agree upon the topology of the network, we're gonna build a topology table. Remember, once that table is built, the routers will then execute the, the shortest path first algorithm to find the lowest cost to all the, all the different networks in the entire internet network. And then that will be placed into the routing table. So you can see very quickly how this is a much more complex process than something as simple as RIP, which simply goes and says, hey, whoever's got the shortest number of hops to a network, that's the way I'm gonna go. The beauty is because each router understands the network better, it's better able to make routing decisions through the network using the optimal path. So that's the key. Now, why do we need DRs? Well, in multi-access networks, the problem we have is that all routers have to create an adjacency with all other routers by default. In small networks, it's not gonna have a huge impact because here's, I call this the satanic network just because it looks like a pentagram. But you have five routers and you would end up with, because there are five routers, each router would have up 10 adjacencies. And there is actually a formula here, N number of routers, times n minus one divided by two tells you the number of adjacencies you have to form on multi-access networks. And again, 10 adjacencies, still a lot. I mean, that's a lot to hold in your adjacency table. But imagine if you had 20 routers, your adjacencies go to 190. 
So what Cisco, and actually not Cisco, because this is an RFC open standard protocol, what the protocol designers decided is, hey, if it's a multi-access network like Ethernet, we're going to create what's called a designated router. And it's going to be where all other routers form their adjacency. And by the way, they will form an adjacency with the designated router and the backup designated router. And so we're going to create, instead of this network, where when some R2 needs to flood out its LSAs, link state advertisements, it has to go out to everybody, be multicast out to everybody. You'll notice how much all of this, everybody's sending out their LSAs, and so you got a mess. Instead of having this, what we're going to do is we're going to create the concept of a DR. All the routers in the network will form an adjacency with the DR and the BDR. And then when they need to send a link state advertisement, they'll send it to the DR and the BDR. That DR will then take it and flood it back out to the other routers. So instead of R1 flooding it to everyone and R5 and R4 and R3, they send the link state advertisement up to R2 and then it's flooded once out to every other router in the multi-access network. Now, there are always gonna be DRs, designated routers. There could be backup designated routers. There doesn't have to be, but typically you always want at least one backup designated router. And then you have what's called a druther, and that is a router which is neither a DR or a BDR, but could be a, a DR or BDR if one went down. So for instance, let's imagine we have this network here. R2 and R3, DR, BDR. R1 through and R4 and R5 could be druthers. If R2 failed, R3 would become the BDR and R4 would become a backup designated router. Or whoever met the parameter, which again, typically it's the router with the highest priority that's been set on the interface, or it's the router with the highest router ID, OSPF router ID. Now folks, that's a basic understanding of OSPF. One of the things I want you to think about is it does establish its neighbor relationships. We do that with our hello packets, remember, and we go through our down, init, two-way, on down through. Once we're in two-way, we exchange our link state advertisements. Those we exchange our databases with one another. We build that database, so we build our topology table. We execute the shortest path first algorithm to find the shortest path based upon the cost of the links. And remember, link cost is lower for faster links. And then we choose the best route and place that in the forwarding information base or the routing table. Okay, I hope this has been useful. Have a great afternoon and we'll move on to single ASPF actual configuration in our next lecture.